it can be quite difficult to get over the fact that yeah you died yeah you just did yeah and that that's been a difficult I mean, my, my family obviously experienced it when you, you see somebody you haven't seen for ages and they go how are you are you all right and you go well yeah since my cardiac arrest and they go i didn't even know you had a cardiac arrest oh my god yeah so you, you relive it a couple of times um and communicate in that fact they go but you look so well yeah yeah we do look well but yeah it's it's been it's been hard Hey everyone, a warm welcome to the podcast of the Heart Warrior Project. My name is Yelis Fass and I am a sudden cardiac arrest survivor. Here on the podcast, I chat with fellow survivors to help anyone out there who is going through the same emotional roller coaster. Now, in this episode, I sat down with cardiac arrest survivor and heart warrior Ellen Owen as we talked about how he survived his cardiac arrest, what may have caused it things he learned throughout his journey, and so much more. Another topic we talked quite a lot about is uh, dealing with fatigue. This is such an important topic as so many survivors, Ellen and I included, experience it. It's also a very misunderstood topic, I would say, as it's often invisible to those who are not going through the same thing. From the outside, many of us survivors look just fine, you know? Um, and this is something I've personally heard people tell me all the time when they ask me how I'm doing in the aftermath of my cardiac arrest. It's honestly frustrating and only other survivors such as Ellen will truly understand what it's like to have to deal with this kind of fatigue. Now, I truly enjoyed uh, talking to Ellen. I feel we touched upon a lot of important uh, topics in this conversation. And I hope that it can provide you some support if you are a fellow cardiac arrest survivor. One last thing, Alan also wrote a book about his journey as a cardiac arrest survivor called One in Ten Survivor, Life After Cardiac Arrest. You can find it linked up in the show notes located in the description of this episode, where you can also find additional resources to help you live a better life as a survivor. Now, if you can't find the show notes that way, you can also find it by going directly to heartwarriorproject.com slash podcast. With that, I hope you find this conversation with Heart Warrior and Cardiac Arrest Survivor Ellen Owen insightful, helpful, but most of all, supportive. Ellen, a warm welcome here to the podcast of the Heart Warrior Project. It's uh, it's really awesome to talk to you. Thank you very much. It's great to be on here. So, you know, where did all this start for you? You know, like, when did you hit your cardiac arrest? Uh, and, of course, like, who saved you? So, it actually um, happened to me on the 3rd of April, 2022. Oh, so that's... It's almost, almost a year ago. Oh, that's not long ago, actually. No, no, so it's coming up to sort of the year anniversary. In, oh, yeah. Sort of next week. Yeah. Um, I was <clears throat> playing at a walking football tournament. Um, I'm 51. I'm going to be 52 in a couple of weeks. Well, actually, I'm 52 tomorrow. So oh, well, congrats! Year, but, <laughs> congrats. Um, um, so yeah, so I was playing in a in a walking football tournament, which um, is football for the old, over 50s that allows you to get back playing football when you can't run as fast as you used to. And I was I played the first match. It's like a six aside football tournament. Yeah. Um, and I was stood with my colleague uh, watching our other team play. And unfortunately, I collapsed. I collapsed and fell to the floor. Um, luckily, he was a police officer, mm. an ex-police officer retired. So he knew what to do in mm. terms of putting me in the recovery position. So he put me in the recovery position, checked my pulse that was very faint, and then checked it again and realized that it had stopped. But yeah, I, yeah. So he turned, flipped me over, and another guy that I play football with came. Uh, he's an ex-army um, man. Um, he came over, so he knew CPR and started CPR immediately on me. So I wasn't, didn't have much time with no CPR at all. Um, I was lucky at a leisure centre, which meant that they, they called people for the leisure centre, and that leisure centre luckily had a defibrillator there on on site where I was so three of their team came running mm -hmm. uh, with an, they have an emergency bag for situations like this um, 
they then took over the CPR from the guy that gave me the CPR um, and prepped the defib um, and gave me three shocks of a defib and then my heart came back and started beating again. So that was about eight minutes of no heartbeat. Yeah, yeah. And then the ambulance came and everything, I guess. Yeah, so then they called um, an air ambulance. So we have in Wales here, we have a Wales air ambulance. Oh, that's so, different than in Belgium. <laughs> yeah, so an air yeah. ambulance landed. The the teams, there was lots of teams playing that day. And yeah. they had to move all of the goals and kit and everything out of the way. So the air ambulance wow. actually landed next to me, almost on the pitch. So <laughs> imagine I'm lying in the middle of a football pitch. Yeah, It landed yeah. in one half. And the critical care practitioner came out and assess my situation and they were there from the 999 call they were there within 20 minutes at my site which is absolutely incredible yeah yeah mm. wow um, she assessed me and realized that um, i would need to be ventilated um, there and then um and i'd need to be under a general anesthetic and she was very worried about my condition so she actually called for a doctor to come and a second air ambulance came and landed, in the other, and landed in the other half of the pitch. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so there is actually a picture of the two air ambulances. Wow. Either, either side of either end of the pitch of me. And the I pitch. mean, besides, what, of course, what has happened, which is terrible, right? But uh, that's an impressive sight, I guess. Yeah, yeah, you don't usually get two. Especially if you know nothing of this anymore, right? Yeah, uh, and I don't remember it either. I've, yeah. I'm still, I have no memory. And then... Uh, they took me by road ambulance to the hospital, local hospital, because they felt my condition that I might arrest again. So they took me via road ambulance. And then I was assessed in hospital, you know, the MRI scans and um, CT scans. And I <clears throat> ended up having two stents fitted. Um, and I had a diagnosis of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Which Can I you explain... Can you explain what that actually is about or what it is? Yeah, the hypertrophic cardiomyopathy is the thickening of the heart walls. Yeah, that's why the stents. And now, but I actually had two stents because they thought that I had partial blockage as well in two oh, okay. of the arteries. So I had a partial blockage, but the, heart, the, the HCM had what had caused my cardiac arrest. Um, so the thickening of the heart walls meant that my, I was explained to me that my heart had started clapping together rather than pumping and it started together. So it, it then shut down um which meant that now i have a hcm i've also been given an icd so i have a internal icd with the defib and pacing of the heart so i was in hospital for 11 days uh, i had the stents fitted within a couple of days two of them <clears throat> and i had the icd fitted within 11 days yeah, yeah. 10 days like that and then out the next day but wait like this just came out of the blue in a way, right? Yep, I had no symptoms. I had nothing. I played. The, I played the first game. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. For for ten minutes, we played the first game. I wasn't out of breath. I wasn't exercising. I wasn't. I was just stood. I was just literally stood next to my colleague. He, he said, "I was. T I was talking to you one minute, and the next minute you were on the ground." Just like. Yeah, must be an extremely crazy sight for the people around you to to see that happen to someone, of course, too, right? Yeah, and uh, unfortunately, um, I took taken my son to the event. Mm. So my son is 16, uh, yeah. was at the event. So he saw me collapse. Wow. And saw them working on me. So that was quite a traumatic experience for, for him. Yeah. Damn. Yeah. Yeah. But, but like, uh, also the condition that they diagnosed you right now with, like, did you had anything, like, before that, like, like when you were younger, like anything with your heart? No, my, my father and my brother both died from heart attacks quite oh. young. Oh, damn. Um, but I had been checked, mm. had no issues at all, um, and had no, no problems. You know, I'd been a football player up until I was about 35, until I had an ACL injury, um, and I'd been fine. No issues, no problems. You know, walking, doing, gone back to this walking, football playing, nothing. No symptoms at all, so. And how was, I mean, the recovery? Because it's been just a year. That's super soon that all this happened. Yeah, it's, um, initially, I actually, I have to say, when I had the stents fitted, I actually felt a little bit better. Yeah. Like, yeah, I don't know whether that was psychological or whether it actually, you know. Well, 
I hear a lot of people who have the stance that they also say like, yeah, I felt the difference because blood is flowing better, I guess, through your veins and everything. So, yeah. And and now, obviously, with the medication, um, mm -hmm. taking quite a lot of medication now for HCM, where I was taking nothing before. What are you taking? Um, beta blockers? Yes, beta blockers, blood thinners. Yeah. Um, mm. And uh, a statin as well. So. Oh, oh, yeah. So that that adds, you know, there's lots of side effects to some of the, the drugs. I know. Um, the yep. main one being um, fatigue yep. is the one that, that is the most. Um, yep. And that's really what we're struggling with a lot is, is the fatigue. Some days you're okay. Other days you're, you're, you're not okay. Um, and you look okay. People go, oh, you look fantastic. Yeah. That's amazing. Yeah. And they go, actually, well, yesterday, if you'd seen me yesterday, I was asleep for most of the day. But Yeah. Um, so it, I think physically – not too bad. The, the ICD fitment, obviously, you have to not raise your arm above your head for six weeks. And that took a little bit of getting used to, to have this foreign object in your, in your chair. <laughs> How um, is it now to have it? I mean, after a year? Yeah. I don't even notice it's there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Only when I lie on my left-hand side that you feel it. So, yeah, yeah. Yep. No Can you still you. sleep on it? Because I, I can't sleep good on my left side anymore. Because I always have it like... Put it, yeah, I, I feel a lot then too. Yeah, I, you, you know it's there, you, sort of, you deal with it, you sort of forget it. But then when you do lie, yeah. I say, all right, yeah. that's been a minute, I've got to turn over now. Yeah, same. Yeah, yeah, uh, uh. yeah, yeah. So um, I've gone back, actually, I went back to the walking football after six months. All right. Do a bit of cardio rehab as well, because it's only walking, it's not, you know, it's not running. And um, that was a little bit different because obviously I'm wearing an ICD protector. You know, they do the ICD protectors. Um, from They're from Vital Beats. They're a, a yes. like a Kevlar protector. I have one too. Yep. Yeah. They're and, good. Um, they're really good. Yep. But I wear it and forget about it. But it's the it's the team that I'm playing with. They're, they're all like, yeah, if you get hit with a ball or they barge you or whatever, they're all like, you okay? You okay? You okay? Yeah, they're more worried than you are about it. Um, but yeah, it's an, it's still early days, really, in in terms of the recovery. But it, it has changed the way we work, you know, the way I operate, the way yeah, you know, I can't do the work that I used to do, and I can't do things that I used to do. In but which way? I used to um, drive a lot with work, mm. and I can't do the long distance driving anymore. Um, you get too tired. It just get too tired. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. um, I was on a call out basis and i just can't do that anymore and um so there's a lot more sitting a lot more you know just doing stuff from home and a lot more of just trying to raise awareness and helping so it has changed quite a lot as to what we're doing and uh, we're doing a lot more volunteer work for raising awareness like this sort of thing and and to with the wales air ambulance and that sort of stuff and telling Wait, the story we who is we so I, my wife comes as well to some of the events as well all right yep um, because you know she has a you know her side of the story that she wasn't there, yeah. so she just got the phone call that said you know Oof. Alan's collapsed and you need to come to Cardiff, which is about an hour and Oof. ten fifteen minutes away in a car. So she's driving down the motorway, not knowing whether I'm alive or dead. So she's got a bit of a, a different story to tell than, than I have. Wow. And, have you uh, been so able to talk this through with each other and sort of? Uh... Yeah, because exactly that must be quite scary. Yeah, really, really scary to hear like your 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 partner might be dead or or just had this happen to. That must be super scary. Yeah, Have she, you talked a lot with each other about it. Yeah, we actually um, utilized a service from the Wales Air Ambulance as well. They do a a, a patient liaison service uh -huh. where they have all of the statistics that happen to you. So they've got the the times, the dates, what you had, the medicines, everything else. So because I don't remember, I remember waking up at hospital, um, they filled in the blanks for me and they filled in the blanks for her as well. So sitting with the trained specialist nurse, talking to her about it and talking through what she went through. And the we we're online, the cardiomyopathy group have um, now, because my wife asked the question, do you have a loved ones group? where people can sit, you know, and talk about people that have given CPR or been through the trauma. You know, I mean, I, I was in hospital and they woke me up to ask me questions. I was sort of semi-conscious after having, you know, quite a lot of medication. 
and they asked me the standard questions, you know, what time of day it is, what date it is, you know, yeah. sort of things, yeah. what your injury. And at one point they asked me, do you recognize this person and pointed to my wife? Um, and I said, no. Whoa. But about a few hours later, I did say yes, I did. So yeah. like, the, the trauma of that for her as well, just that one moment, you know, do you recognize her? And I go, no, she's now thinking, oh my God, what's happened to him? Is, is his memory, is he going to remember me? You know, is, is he going to be able to, do I going to have to go through the whole thing again of, of meeting him again and explain it to him and do all the memories again? But I've been lucky because I've not, I can remember all of that, just not the incident. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but your brain and everything has been, that's that's good. Yeah, yeah. I've, I have um, some short-term memory issues. Somebody tells me something, I'll probably forget it five minutes later. Still, still today. Still today. Yeah, still today, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah I'll, I'll walk into a room and go, "Why was I here?" Some of that's age as well, though. When you get in your fifties, you tend to. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but um, but other stuff, I've been so lucky, and I, and I think it was that chain of survival that mm -hmm. I had. You know, somebody knowing CPR, the defib being available within minutes, the yeah. ambulance being there, and everything else, and. And you, you listen to other people, and you listen to a lot of these as well, where they've not had that chain of survival. Yeah, some people don't make it either, and some people do suffer with a lot of other injuries. So. Yeah, mm. and uh, like the fatigue, do you feel like it has improved? And um, I think we're managing it more. Yeah, um, I had a problem with one of the drugs that I was taking. Um, mm -hmm. Um, and as soon as I mentioned it to everybody who's in this sort of arena now, I say oh, I've had a problem with Ramapril. And the first mm. thing they say oh, is, oh, yeah. you, you, you would have had a cough. Yes, um, I <laughs> had the same medication, actually. Yeah. And um, I tried it for six months, the cardio. said, try it for six months. Yeah. Um, but then I had to come off it because it was just keeping me awake at night, coughing constantly, yep. which added to the fatigue. So since that's yep. gone, it's been a lot better. Mm. Um, but I find that, I think I can do too much, so I'll do too much one day, and then the next day I'm suffering for it, and then I'll recover. But it's just about managing it. Once you manage it correctly, you, you're fine. Yeah, you can, you can deal with it. Yeah, I mean, personally, the fatigue, like experiencing that has been the most difficult part of the recovery process. And I feel like for most survivors, that is the case. Because you're so limited. You know, you can't all of a sudden do the things that were so easy like before, like with you, like driving uh, or other things just, and that's so hard actually to take. And then on top of that, the medication makes it even more difficult, right? Because that also increases fatigue. Yeah. And being being banned from driving for six months. Oh, you, wow, uh, yeah. Yeah, it's true. I also was banned for six months. <laughs> yeah, yes. yeah. So, so that, yeah, you can just get in the car and drive anywhere. Suddenly you're being banned for six months saying, right, you cannot drive. You do not have a driving license. You know, I have a driving license for 30 odd years and now you haven't got one. Was was quite difficult because you're used to, you know, taking your son to college and going to places and things and now you're just sat. So the cardiologist told me, don't sit, you know, take your dogs for a walk, try and do as much as you can, try and get up and move about. Mm. Which obviously you, people you want you to do that, but then you want to go, well, actually, I'd like to go out, but my wife's gone out. Well, how do I get out? I can't go out in the car. Yeah, I can't really take a bus. It's, yeah, it's, it was difficult. And that, that was quite stressful at times. Sure. Being stressful able. stressful because of which reason? Being Not being able to do the things, mm. as you said, that you would just right. normally do. You go, right, I just need to go to the shop or I need to go to watch my son play football. Yeah, you were planning things and getting lifts and yeah. um, making sure the wife was there to be able to do it. And then she was obviously stressing about should you go to watch your son play football? I mean, I went like, you know, four weeks later to go watch him play football. Um, and people are then like, oh, what are you doing here? You should be here, you shouldn't be in bed, should you be, you know, all of this sort of stuff. Um, but I wanted to get out and I wanted to do more. Um, and it is, as you say, it, it can be frustrating. Yeah, yeah. A lot of frustrating. How is it actually for your wife or your son today? My wife was very, very jumpy shall we say, about anything that I did. So if I got up and sort of went, oh, she's like, oh my God, what's the matter? What's the matter? What's the matter? Sure. As the time's gone on, it's got a bit better, but she's still very wary of stuff. If I try and do something, she's like, you, you've been told you shouldn't be doing that. Why are you doing this? Why are you doing that? Um, and my son was, was very um, stuck to me, very clingy to begin with. It's got better over time, but he was very much a, I want to be with you, you know, to 
make sure you're okay, make sure you're not doing things. Yeah. You know, and initially, for you know, a good six, eight, maybe ten months, that was the case. It started to drop off a bit more, and my wife started to do other things on her own now, where she was always like, "No, I'm not going to do that because uh, that would leave you on your own, and I'm not. I'm worried about leaving you on your own." Whereas now, I, I'm quite happy to be sat here, yeah, on your own. Um, and she was obviously worried about the ICD fitment. You know, what happens? You know, if it shocked you. Yeah, you know, touch wood, it hasn't. You know, what happened? What should I do? What should I? You know, should I wait? Should I not wait? What should I do? Should I call the police ambulance? You know, what? What should I do? And uh, so there was quite a lot of discussion to be had, and I, I think that that side I didn't expect. Of yeah, you know, and it was mentioned to me by somebody who said, "Well, what happens if I have a shock? Can I can I get shocked when I've got an ICD as well?" You know, all, all these sort of questions. There was an awful lot of questions. Yeah. yeah. These are all. Qu- do, do you know what you can do? Because I actually don't know what you, yeah. what you. Can you get shocked? Like you can get shocked. Yeah, apparently you can get shocked if oh, yeah. your ICD doesn't fire. So yeah, you okay. wait for it to fire and then get shocked. So the, you know all these sort of questions, and and a lot of it came from a football team. I went back to see the football team. Okay. Uh, yeah. And I went back to the air ambulance as well to to meet the people that saved you. And I mean that's quite hard to, to go. And, how do you say thank you to somebody that saved your life? I mean, there's just you can't, can you? You can't say thank you. Yeah. But yeah, you know, they yeah. had questions as well. So we did a, a CPR training and a defib training with them. We mm. bought them a portable defib so that there's always one around. Um, because they had questions then as well. Because you know a couple of them have stepped up and done it, but you know a few others were like, I was in shock. I don't know whether I would be able to step up and do CPR. So we we all did the training. Yeah, this highlights the importance of CPR training, right? Because it literally can save a life. Yeah, I mean, when I, I started doing you know, looking at like the one in 10 survivor start and yeah, uh-huh. and the every, what is it, every minute that goes by with no CPI is reduced yeah. by 10% and those sort of things. Yeah. I mean, it's frightening statistics. Of course. Really, really frightening. One of the things that for me was, I'd had to drive to this football tournament, which was about an hour and a half away from the house with my son in the car. One of the things for me was, why did it happen there? I could have been driving the car. I could have been, you know, we live on a farm and I could have been walking my dogs in the field and I wouldn't be here because, you know, there wouldn't have been anybody around. You know, if I was driving my car with my son in it and crashed the car on the on the motorway, would he have been able to do anything about it? Would I have been? So then it's more along that psychological. You start thinking about why, why there, you know, what, why was it at that time? Why was it? Well, I was stood next to to Martin, who was you know an ex police officer, fully trained, you know, all this sort of thing. Um, so it can play on your mind. I'm sure it's you know, it's done so too. You play on your mind. Yeah. What What, what do you make of this zone then? Like, is I have a bit of the same that I like. I just started dating my girl girlfriends. And I was at her place, but before that, I nine out of ten was always at my own place, sleeping alone. And it just happened that night when I was just at her place. Yeah. And I'm also like, what are the chances that it happened there? And what do you make of this, right? Because yeah, it's so many events of luck kind of involved in in just that moment. Yeah, and when you talk to other people as well, that go, they didn't make it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, because they weren't. There wasn't somebody there, or they were on their own, or yeah, you know, they weren't in a shockable rhythm to come back, or it was more catastrophic. Or something. Yeah, it, it does make you wonder. I mean, yeah, you know, my my brother and father both died of, of heart attacks, not the cardiac arrest. They yeah, had yeah. heart attacks, and and they weren't savable. No matter what what medical you know, professions would have been around them, they weren't savable. And yeah, you, know, you think, well, what? Why was I savable? So there has been a lot more more than physical. Yeah, mentally thinking about it, especially as yeah, I mean the anniversary is coming up. I played football on Sunday and uh, was talking to them about the anniversary, and they were like, "I can't believe it's a year already." Yeah, I can't believe it. It seems like it was yesterday. Yeah, yeah, year flies by in the end, right? So, but yeah, what are you gonna do for your uh, anniversary? Um, or your re birthday? <laughs> we've got. Um, I'm gonna go. We've got a football match um, before, so. I'm going to go back and thank the guys down there because mm-hmm. they they were the the frontline guys that that really stepped up. Um, I did a, some legacy events for the Wales Air Ambulance this week as well, so um, talking to them 
um, and talking for some fundraising for them. So we're, we're trying as much as we can to do that. Um, and as part of my recovery, I, I actually, I wrote a book about my recovery because you did. I wanted, to, I wanted to do something. Wait, what's uh, the book called? It's called one in 10 survivor. One in 10. Can you, I guess, find it on Amazon? Find it on Amazon. Yeah. All right. Um, well, that's um, cool. Amazing. And it gave me something to do sure. while I was thinking about it because the more I came across stuff, I'm sorry, I wasn't in this arena around you know, the sudden carjack arrest and all this, that everything was new to me. And there were so many great people that helped with, you know, like driving and conditions and things. I thought we'd sort of make a journal and we made a journal uh, oh. about what happened and what, thing. but there's chapters in there from my wife and from a friend of ours who came to get my son um, who was there. So you've got quite a few different perspectives. So it's quite good. Um, so we've, we've decided that you know, we'll try and raise awareness as much as possible because there are people who don't make it and there are people who are still raising awareness even though their loved ones have gone and we just feel lucky to be here really I'm still at that stage that I think you know why that still goes through your head all the time why did you make it I'm sure it does the same with you um, but I'm just so thankful for a second chance to be able to raise awareness, help, do other things, hmm. and just do as much as possible so that more and more people more, will yeah. survive this. Yeah. Uh, yeah, that's beautiful that you're putting so much work into all this. And yeah, going through something like this, that's just so hard to, to put a place, you know, to give a place in a way. Like for me, also starting this project has also been like a very healing journey for me but also a very meaningful one like i feel like i am giving something you know to other survivors by talking to survivors uh to make just this journey a little bit less lonely um but it's giving back right that that feels right to do when you've gone through something like this i mean you're you're obviously you know a young man a very young man yeah and um so yeah you know, I think that some people think, well, actually what was said to me was the walking football is between 50 and 80, basically. So we've got players on our team that are 75 years old. And I went back to another tournament because they cancelled the tournament. So I went back to the tournament uh, the next one after. Of course, people are asking the manager, what happened to your guy? Because they don't know. Yeah, they've just come to play and they what happened to your guy? And it's like, you can talk to him if you like, he's stood here. And they were all... They were like, no way is he stood here. Yeah, he was really poorly. He's really, I'm like, yeah, I'll chat to them. And one of the guys said to me, if we lined everybody up that was at this tournament, I would have never have picked you out to be the one to have a cardiac arrest. And that really sort of resonated with me that, that it happens to anybody. Yeah, yeah. No matter what age, yeah, it can literally happen to anybody at any time. And so much undiagnosed conditions, um, you know, youngsters, you see it in the papers every day. You know, I mean, I'm a big American football fan and, you know, watching Damar Hamlin have his right. cardiac arrest. I'm actually a yeah. Buffalo Bills supporter as well. So that was quite a difficult thing to watch. And I was watching it live and, you know, you just realise that, you know, this is happening every day to yep. and affecting families and affecting people every day. Yeah, age is not per se the factor that, yeah, like, it's not per se 80 or old, that, like you said, that will have it. It's exactly, it's young people. Mm -hmm. uh, that have it too or very fit people even people that you never would have expected it to happen to it happens to it can happen to everyone yeah and that's very scary yeah I mean you take like Christian Erickson do you know what I mean yeah a guy yep, uh, yep. I mean probably one of the fittest guys you come out in yeah. the top of his profession a professional profession and, that, and it happens to him so yeah and I, th I think the awareness levels are getting better especially in the UK there's a lot more defibs around yeah, there's a lot more our training and stuff and people are becoming aware of it and there's some fantastic people doing some fantastic work out there to get the awareness levels up you know like like self to because there's more and more and more is needed and, and cpr training especially if you get cpr training at a young age or um, we're trying to enforce that yeah I'm, I'm quite a big believer in if you're running like a social event or, or a social event like sports event like we were that there should be some trained people with cpr and a defib should be available for sure all the time yeah yeah for sure yeah yeah yeah, yeah i was talking to um the the previous episode i was talking to a cop uh 
And he's actually right now, because he had a cardiac arrest as well, very young guy, very fit. And uh, he's now uh, also really trying to promote like having more AADs in, in public places. But also, like most of the time, he said like people have a cardiac arrest, not at the swimming pool, but at their home. Mm-hmm. And he also pointed out like it's quite crazy that we don't have one in apartments or at home and i know it can be maybe expensive but at the same time it could save so many lives like the reason why the survivor rate is so low is because we just don't have the right tools at the right moment many times yeah yeah i mean you're you're right i mean i mean we've got a couple here but i know where i live in wales there is one over the road in a in a in a telephone box what was an old telephone box but but if my wife was to go out there, get that, get yeah. that code and come back, that would be 10 minutes. Yes. Yeah. So that's way too much, right? Too much for, too much, yeah. yeah, yeah. You need to immediately act. 10 minutes is too long. Yeah. And yeah, my son wouldn't be doing CPR for 10 minutes. Yeah. CPR is difficult. It, it is difficult to do. I don't think people appreciate it. It's quite difficult to do for a long period it's of time. It's a workout. But, yeah. Yeah. And uh, so again, that, that here, you know, Obviously, now you've got your own in ICD and mm-hmm. planted, but for somebody else, something to live on a farm with a few other people, then uh, that we'd have to go and get that one. And I know in my head that that is too long. Yes, it is. From experience, then, mm-hmm. to go and get one. Hey, my apologies for interrupting the conversation. It will just take a moment. If you like the conversation so far and would like to support the Heart Warrior Project, check out the truly awesome looking t-shirts and mugs I created together with an illustrator for fellow Heart Warriors. My goal in creating the t-shirts and mugs was to create something that would help me feel more empowered in the battle that surviving this cardiac arrest has been and, well, still is in many ways. To show not only the world, but also myself, the heart warrior that that I have become. And by offering the t-shirts and mugs on the Heart Warrior Project, I too hope that it can help fellow cardiac arrest survivors feel empowered too. The mug has become my go-to mug. I, I drink my coffee from it every morning and my tea throughout the day. Also, the t-shirts I personally love so much that I ordered more than a couple of them myself. I frequently wear one throughout the day and uh, certainly you can see me wear the t-shirt when I'm out climbing. I can only say this, have a look at the t-shirt designs and the mugs. And if you like what you see, I tell you, you won't regret ordering either the t-shirt, the mug or both of them. Not only will you have a fitting mug and or t-shirt for your current lifestyle, but you'll also be supporting the Heart Warrior Project and help me to continue doing this. In the description of this episode, you can find a link that will take you to the page where you can order both the t-shirt and the mug, or you can also go directly to heartwarriorproject.com to find it. All right, thanks for taking a moment to listen. Now let's return to the conversation. In which other ways has your life changed like you already mentioned a few things but has there been other ways that your life changed that are still quite difficult for you to accept yeah i i did doing the the normal day-to-day stuff is quite difficult for me not being able to do it um i you know we were quite active i was refereeing my son's football matches um stepping in and those sorts of things and not being able to do that uh I think it's more the 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 stuff that I was used to doing and been doing for years pretty much stopped and you had to reevaluate and that was really difficult. Yeah, you know, there were other people that would take over roles and do stuff at work and things like that. But when you're used to doing the you know, I'll carry the rubbish out, I'll cut the grass, I'll do this and the people yeah. are going, Well, you can't do that yet. Yeah, you, know, you, yep. you will get to that far, you will get there and yeah, you will get there. But just to stop it and say, right, don't pick this up because it's really heavy because, you know, you shouldn't be lifting heavy things with the ice to start with. And you know, those sorts of things where you would just go and do it. And that was really difficult for me to, to go, well, no, you shouldn't be doing that. You know, and I, I would, I had to go to London for an important meeting, um, which meant I went on the train. My sister came with me, um, lifting heavy bags off the train and then walking a long distance, you know, getting a cab, whereas I would have gone, well, actually, I'll walk that because it's not very far, but no, no, let's get in a cab now and do that. So I think that whole change of 
actually thinking about stuff where stuff you wouldn't think about you wouldn't think twice of doing now people are reminding you that you perhaps you just need to think about it before you end and planning journeys i would i would go from wales to london on the train go for a meeting and come back all in the same day get up early go now that's changed i go the day before yeah yeah we have a rest we do the meeting we might stay that night as well and then come back because of the fatigue yeah. you know try not to have too many late night traveling trips anywhere on the train uh, even though you're only sitting it's still making you tired so planning is the big thing now we have to plan everything yeah. more than i would have done much that stuff yeah. yeah yeah it's like you all of a sudden are like 90 year old 90 year olds old right yeah it's just like holy crap <laughs> yes yeah. 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 yeah 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 and and i think that was quite hard for my wife as well because i I was quite an independent person we were mm -hmm. doing quite a lot of stuff um yeah and doing lots of things suddenly to go actually no we can't do that now and sometimes the family as well you know when you, you, people come and go he looks so well great right, I've, yeah. i've got this event going on we could we can go here if we, we meet here then we can go to this pub it's only about two miles up the road you could walk that couldn't you and, and it's up a hill and, and people are going well no we can't do that at the moment yeah. yeah we'd have to get you there or meet you there and, yeah whereas it, it's a bit more planning so it's less carefree wife, right yes totally yeah yeah, yeah. and uh, my wife is um she took up running in the uh, in the lockdown and but she's really taken to that so that she'll go off and run she's doing a half marathon at the weekend um and that's her release for it to switch off and just go right and go running um you know from doing a lot more than for me and caring for me a lot more than what she'd ever done yeah. so that's quite difficult as well to to start relying on other people yeah i will have to say like a year is that that's really nothing though like uh you know you're still in a recovery phase though it's it's like like i'm now two years almost three years in Wait, am I two years? No, two years. I think two years. Yeah, it's two years. Uh, but uh, I feel even now that I'm still recovering after two years. It's like so slow, I feel. But it's getting slightly better with each year. That's my experience at least. But also the one that I feel that I hear from a lot of survivors. Like it takes a long time. And we often expect like a year does sound in a way long. But for this, a year is nothing. Yeah, I had um, my yearly follow-up appointment with uh, the nurse yeah. a couple of weeks ago. And she said, you've got to remember what your body went through. Mm -hmm. yep. She said, just because you know, some days you feel like, okay, I feel all right. Yeah. The trauma that your body's been through, yeah, yeah. it's going to take a long time to recover. You can't just switch it on and switch it off. Mm -hmm. and go actually I feel better now I'm going to do it yeah there's some people that you know are worse than others and everybody's on their own journey and I think that's that's what I've learned is that you know some people have been affected a lot more than I have sort of brain wise and you know and lots of people have got brain injuries and stuff and I'm really lucky in that respect um, but we're all, we're all at the same thing but everybody's on a different journey a different path yeah and uh, but yeah I think time and that's the most frustrating part sometimes yeah you want to do of stuff, course you know, yeah They go, well, just chill a little bit, chill a while. Yeah. yeah. You just want to continue with your life, right? But such a big event like this does ask for some time. Yes. Yeah. And But, uh, I'm quite lucky. I've got, you know, the, the support and the wife's really good. You know, sends me really good. The, the company I work for have been brilliant. Mm. Um, mm. Yeah. They, they gave me a long time. I've actually retired from work now. But they, for a while, just taking some time off. And they... They've been brilliant, and I'm I'm quite lucky in that respect. I know some other people haven't been that lucky. You know, I I really don't know how I would have coped with it actually if I had been on my own. You mean without like your wife or how yes, do you mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah mm -hmm. wife, family. Yeah, if you were more of a single person that didn't say have any siblings or parents, yeah, or, you know, a support network around you, I think that would have been really really difficult. So I'm really lucky with that that I've got a great family and friends that have been fantastic. Yeah, I mean. With anything, right? Any big major thing in life, having a good support system around you, yeah, is extremely important and extremely helpful to recover from this or from anything. Uh, I mean, so you're right. Yeah. yeah, yeah. The groups that we've been 
you know, there's you know different groups online on Facebook and things like that as well. Yeah. And just talking to people, I mean, talking to like yourself and and talking to other people in a group. Yeah, you know, when, when you're talking about you know drugs or you talk, you're new to it and you know talk about driving and all these sorts of things, and these people go, "Well, I went through that. Yeah, you know, mm-hmm. just do this and do that. There's different ways." And, and just talking to people that you think, well, actually, I spoke to one lady. Yeah, you know, her cardiac arrest was like 15 years ago, and, and, and she looked amazing. She's like, and I haven't had one since, and I'm fine. I've still got my ICD, and I've had two ICDs, and you know, all the sort of stuff. And you think, well, you can see that this is me. That would be me 15 years later. Which yeah, is hope, like, yeah, yeah, right. Yeah. And that's good to talk with someone who is like way more up, like yeah, like 15 years ahead of you to just yeah. see like what life could look like. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Was and there, it 50 there was or 15? 15. 15. 15. Yeah. yeah okay. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, and there was actually we were on we were on one of the groups and we were talking about fatigue and there was a big Zoom meeting with lots of people on, and one of the guys actually fell asleep in the Zoom meeting while we were talking about fatigue. Okay. Like, well, yeah. <laughs> that's really to <laughs> highlight like, how fatigued we are, right? Yeah, he's like, yeah. I've nodded off, haven't I? It's like, yeah, yeah, you nodded off with because he was obviously quite comfortable talking to people. And just, <laughs> just caught up in it. But truly, what you pointed out, like the fatigue, is something that you don't always just notice when you just look at you from the outside. Yeah. yeah. You look fine, right? Yeah. Same what people many times have told me as well. Like, oh, you look great. But the fatigue is, damn, it's such a... It's such a hard thing to handle every day. People really don't get it, who don't experience it, experience it on, a, on a daily basis. Like, it really messes with your, with your head, with your moods, with just your life in a way... Yeah that I don't think is highlighted enough in a way, right? Yeah, and yeah. I find um, concentration. Yeah, when you're, yeah. you're sat in, say, a meeting, yeah, like I've sat in a meeting day for like a couple of hours, two, three hours. Yeah. After that meeting, because I was so concentrated on that meeting, after that meeting, I had some lunch, and then that was it. That was me done for the day. I was out. I was asleep. I was gone. And... Uh, my wife, Mel, said, "Yeah, this is what people don't see. They saw you at the meeting, yes, but they didn't see the other bit that you were asleep for four hours after that three-hour meeting." Yeah, yeah, and that's what many of us go through all the time. Yeah, and it's like a hidden part of yep. you know, that you're going through that other people from the outside world don't see. And I think you're right; the fatigue part is is a major thing. Yeah. Um, again, like you talk about it for planning and and for other stuff, is to make sure that you're you're okay and I think that with f- fatigue what you were talking about yeah about moods and mm-hmm. everything else it does play with your mind of it course really yeah. yeah like the medication that you're currently on do you know is this for the rest of your life is they are they gonna reduce like the amount that you have to take I had um, I had a yearly review and they've kept it at the same after the first year mm. but they're hoping to drop at least one of them off yeah, because that could already help a lot with the fatigue too. Yeah, I was talking to the, uh, the, the the pharmacist and she said, you've also got to realize that you've gone from taking no drugs yeah, yeah. to taking a cocktail of drugs. So your body, even that has gone, what, yeah. what's all these drugs you're suddenly taking? Yeah, so yeah. you got like the double dose of like recovering from your cardiac arrest and your body adapting to all the medication. Yes. It's, yeah, so, yeah. so yeah, you, you've got to realise that you're different now. Yeah, you know, it's a different situation than what you were beforehand. Mm. But with the medication slowing down my HCM and the ICD and the stents, I'm in a much better place. Yeah, you know, I was described as you know my sister described me as a ticking time bomb before because you didn't know it could have been yeah, any time, and and she's right. Yeah, you were a ticking time bomb, but now. We've, we've got it under control, you're being regularly monitored, you've got the ICD and it's downloading information to the hospital. You know, all these sorts of stuff is is so much better than what we were a year ago and you've got to look at it that way, I think. Mm. You're right, yeah. yeah. Is there actually anything that you wished your cardiologist would have told you sooner or just something that you found out by yourself that you kind of wish like, like, yeah, like your doctor like could have told you maybe? I... I come back to what we were talking about is fatigue. Mm. Yeah, I, I knew what, you know, having experienced my father, I had to take, you know, it was a recovery period and, you know, that you would, 
you, you were going to be obviously working slightly differently, I think, but the level of fatigue is, is something that I didn't appreciate mm -hmm. a, a lot of. And, you know, going out, bending down, standing up quite quickly. Yeah. You, know, yeah. Um, you find a wall, you go a bit. Yep. Yeah, and then even taking our dog for a walk, we live, we live on a farm, so we, we can go out in the field and take a dog for a walk and come back. And then realize actually that you need to sit down because you're a bit tired. But you felt all right before you took them for a walk, but then you realized you overexerted yourself a little bit. And I think it's just that, whereas before you'd go, you'd overexert yourself a little bit, you know, you'd sit down, have a cup of tea, and you'd be fine for the rest of the day. But now you've overexerted yourself, so that's it. And that wasn't, I don't think that was explained enough that it's going to affect you that way. So you're going to have to change the way you live. My cardiologist actually has been, he's been fantastic. He, he was, he was an exceptional guy. Um, a guy called professor Yousaf in Cardiff, who was absolutely brilliant. He, he had humor, which was fantastic. Yeah. When he, he put my ICD in, um, and he said, you know, I'm gonna have to test this ICD to make sure it works. Uh, I'm going to have to, you know, sort of simulate you having a cardiac arrest again, see whether it works. And, uh, he said, uh, when you sign contracts, people will say, oh, you're signing your life away, but this time you really are signing your life away. <laughs> And he added that he made you feel totally relaxed. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. yeah. And uh, but yeah, there, there is great information out there, but there's also some, some real misinformation about out there. Yeah, the, the cardiomyopathy group have been fantastic, and the sudden cardiac arrest groups and all these sort of things have been brilliant. Yeah, British Heart Foundation's good, and but the, if you know, people go, don't Google it because <laughs> you'll get yeah all sorts of stuff come up. But I've but what I've found is that talking to other people i think it is probably the best thing that i've ever done it's just gone how did it affect you how has it affected you especially that so like yourself you're like a year later on than i am and go well is it still affecting you a year later than me how is it for you and even though you, you might have had something slightly different in different circumstances you can still relate to people which i think is, is brilliant and we were quite lucky that our nurse our icd nurse gave us all of these groups to go and join straight away oh she and did that, uh, yeah and i know that other people have not had that list of people to go and to go and join no and they almost felt a little bit alone until they found them themselves yeah we got given a pack and go you really need to you know talk to these people there you can join if you want it was it was up to you but we have found this big support group almost immediately wait were it support groups online or also in in person um, we've got for the cardiomyopathy, we've got both online and in person. Wow! I'm actually going to one on Saturday for the first um, so, time. Uh, this is the second time we've gone. Second to. time, yeah. Yeah. Um, the last one we had was in person. There was about forty, fifty people there. There was uh -huh. a cardiologist there. Yeah. Oh, really? Yeah, you could talk uh, to him about stuff. And uh, we had some personal experiences. People talking about genetics and all these sort of things. And so it was really good. It was yeah. really good. And there were other people that were further on the journey than I was, people that mm. had just been newly diagnosed. So there was a whole range of, of people. And just wow. interacting with them was fantastic. Yeah, yeah, because yeah. you all of a sudden are not alone or the only person who has like a, who is a cyborg, right? <laughs> yes, so, yeah. <laughs> oh, okay. See, that's the side that I feel has always been missing or needs even more attention, like the emotional support. Because at least here in Belgium, like none of that was given to me. And yeah. Yeah, I don't even know if there's any in-person support groups here in Belgium, which sounds very surprising. But the fact that they don't even mention it in the two years that I went to the hospital each time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, sounds to me like they don't have one. Yeah, uh, this is a... Um a cardiomyopathy group. So yeah, yeah, yeah. With coma. but with the cardiomyopathy comes people with an ICD. Right. Yeah. People that have had a cardiac arrest. It's mm. yeah, there's different people have got different diagnoses and stuff. But yeah. you, you talk to somebody and go, I've got an ICD, they go, so have I. Mm -hmm. I mean I was actually playing walking football and um, I'd taken my top off and I had a t shirt on underneath that had SCA survivor and night. And a guy came wandering over to me and went, When was yours? Mm. I saw back then it was like six months ago. He saw mine was five years ago, wow. and then he pulled his top down and said, like, "ICD, like yeah, ICD." Yeah, yeah. But if I hadn't had that top on, he would have probably never come over. Sure, but, yeah. yeah. So, so there was another guy there who'd gone through the same thing but five years before. So, 
Yeah, yeah. it creates a bond all of a sudden, like instantly, because you're like, damn, another one. Another one. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I've met only once now in the in the two years uh, another person with an ICD or who also had a cardiac arrest, and yeah, we had a good conversation together. <laughs> yeah, we had, uh, we had a long chat because he was playing on another team, and we were talking about it, how long he's been playing, and all these things. And you just instantly fall into like a a rapport and and talk to them about how is it, why is it, has it been any good, has it shocked you? Yeah, all these sorts of things. You you just you just talk. I mean, I'm assuming yours hasn't shocked you. No, no. Um, well, I hope it will never shock me, but uh, I guess at the same time, I'm, I'm, I'm curious to know how it would feel. <laughs> yes, yeah. <laughs> you know? Yeah. But also a little yeah. bit scared of it. Because uh, yeah. that's one thing that does play with your mind a little bit. I mean, online, some of the support groups, are sudden ICD, uh, there's an sure. ICD support group on Facebook, and mm-hmm. you, they go, oh, I had my first shock today. And people, mm. first reaction is people who've not had a shock go, how did it feel? <laughs> of course. What happened? Yeah, and, and they go, oh, it, it was, it was horrific, or I didn't feel it, I was out, or you know, all these sorts of things. And um, yeah, so that's the only worrying part about it. And my wife does worry a little bit about that, how she would react. I think she's like, mm. how I, I react if if it did go off. How do you feel about it? About you know potentially at some point getting shocked. It is worrying. It does worry you. Yeah. Because yeah. you don't know when, right? Because you don't know. No. Yeah. Um, I, I think if I was at home, I'd feel a bit better. Uh, but <laughs> again, yeah, if you were out somewhere, yeah, when I'm out walking the dogs and things like that, now, yeah, you think, well, what happens if it over here? Would I be led in a field? Yeah. Would I wake up suddenly, you know, 20 minutes later? Or would I wake up five minutes later? Or would I not? It's, it's, it's hard. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, I talked to um, a survivor, Jasmine, who is the admin of the Facebook group, uh, support group of Sudden Cardiac Arrest Survivors. And she has been shocked twice. I think after, I think it was between like 15 years or something also, or like 10 years. And uh, But she actually, uh, because I asked her, of course, like, how did he feel? And she was like, you know, it was actually quite okay. Because she had this... And I too have that now. Like I have this image in my head that it's gonna be the worst experience in my life, mm-hmm. and she had that too. And actually, when it happened, she said, "Like, of course, it didn't feel good, but it was not as terrible." Yeah. But that's her. Uh, that's her experience, right? It could be so different for for each and all of us. Um, yeah. Yeah, I actually spoke to a lady who had a shock uh, only two weeks after having her ICD fitted. Whoa, whoa. She had it fitted for um, precautionary measures, not for because she'd had a cardiac arrest. Whoa. She was, she was in the shower and um, she collapsed in the shower and it shocked her. She doesn't remember the shock because she'd already passed out and it brought her back. Oh, she passed um, out? Damn. Yeah, she passed out in the shower first for, and then then it shocked her and brought her back. And oh. I said to her, how did that make you feel? And she, and she said, I don't remember the shock. She said, but... The fact that I'd taken that decision to have that ICD implanted was probably the best decision that I'd ever made because I would not be here. Yeah. She said, so don't be worried about the shock because it's mm. doing its job. That's what it's there for. And if you get a, you know moments of pain, sure, the job you're coming back. So yeah. Don't be afraid of it. And one of the one of the tricks that I don't know whether you've done it or not. One of the tricks we were told was to get the family to name it. The ICD. Name your ICD. Uh, I've not done that, actually. <laughs> and ask the family to embrace that you've now got this. Yeah, yeah. Things could happen and give it a name. There are some strange names that people have come up with. Wait, you gave it yours? You, you have a name for it? For your uh, ICD? Yeah, well, actually, I uh, let the family name it. They, they've they named it Arnie. Arnie? After the Terminators, because it's I'll Be Back. <laughs> All right. <laughs> oh, so that's a good name, thing. actually. Uh, yeah, and I've, I've, I've noticed online a few other people started doing that as well. So it was like Sparky and all these Sparky, sorts of sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But so to, to sort of almost like embrace it as a family so you know you've got it rather than be worried about it, actually. Yeah, it's just one part of the part of the Yeah. Family. Arnie had a busy day at work today. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I will think about what I will actually ask my family at some point too and see what they will come see what, up with. See what they come up with, yes, yeah. It, and it was quite a good way of talking about it, actually. Mm. Yeah, because it is something completely different. Yeah, it was yeah. something that I thought I would have had implanted. And yeah, so it was a way of talking about it and just 
adding a bit of humor to it as well. Exactly. That helps a lot, right? Yeah. Because it's already such a serious thing to have died. Yeah. And to have come back and to have to go through all this now. To add some humor to many of those serious events that you can go through in life. That's... Yeah, I read, a, I read an article like yesterday, actually, um, mm. about, yeah, people talk about, you know, were you actually dead or not? And, you know, and this article talked about being clinically dead. Effectively, you are clinically dead and it's your biological cells that are starting to die without the, the oxygen levels and everything else and the heart pumping rate. So biologically, your cells are dying off. And effectively, you're clinically dead. And, and when you sit and think about that, you think, crikey, yeah, eight minutes I was dying for and that's a quite a long time but luckily I had people around me to, to you know save me but yeah you were dead for eight minutes I mean I don't know what your experience is of remembering anything I mean I remember going to the football match and I remember waking up in the hospital that's all I remember I don't remember anything else yeah same a bit I mean I remember the day <clears throat> and that was it mm. some of the things even from the day not the whole day um that's a super uh, weird experience. My teammates actually joke um, when I went back because they'd seen I was okay. Mm -hmm. um, initially, they didn't know whether I was okay or not, and they couldn't look at – we've got a WhatsApp group, and they couldn't look at the group because they were waiting for updates from Al to say, yeah, he didn't make it or yeah, something. And um, obviously, she told him that I'd made it, so I was okay. Um, I went back, and one of the guys said to me, do you remember playing in the first match? I said, look, I remember getting changed. I don't remember anything. He said, that's good because you played rubbish in the first match. Anyway. <laughs> he was using it, and he said afterwards, I was only joking, but I was using, he was using the humour yeah. to mask what had happened to him yeah. and the trauma that he'd gone through because he was helping at the time. So. Yeah. yeah humour humor can help heal such wounds. Definitely, definitely. And we... Yeah, and the football team have been fantastic, you know, rallying around my son and, and, and the family and, and helping in ways that they don't know. It's just been brilliant for me to go back and watch. I sat and watched them play. Every week I used to go back and got me out of the house and just sit in the stands and watch and, and be around them socially and, and you know, have a laugh and a joke with them. And, you know, it's great to study here and that sort of stuff. And, and it, you know, it affected three or four of them. You know, I, I was told later off that the three or four that would share the car they were driving back you know and these are grown men that were you know were crying in the car because they didn't know that whether you were going to survive or not and what they'd seen and what they'd gone through and and, and sometimes that's not reflected back to, to people that you know, they'd gone through a lot of trauma as well yeah is there actually anything else that helps you besides like humor um when you do feel like bad tired frustrated uh or lonely even do it to what has happened? Um, like, is there anything that helps you emotionally? What I tend to do is, I'm, I like to take my dogs for a walk, mm -hmm. just to go and, and go out and start to look at the, the the stupid things. Like you go out and go, oh, the, the sun shining. You know, it, it's just like it's just you know, look at that. You know, it, like yesterday here in Wales was a beautiful day. Two the dogs for a walk over the field, playing frisbee with one dog. Yeah, the other dogs are off in the hedgerow sniffing and things. Just whereas I wouldn't have done that before. I don't know. Oh, come on, we've got to take the dogs for a walk. Whereas now mm -hmm. I go, well, actually, no, let's let's do it, and it's done for a purpose. So uh, I think you notice the the smaller things, and yeah. also that you you're not bothered by some of the other stuff. You know, if a car cuts you up in front of you, I see. Yes. So, well, yeah, yeah. It's not into the world. Well, well, you're still here, so yeah. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. And uh, I, I'm definitely a bit more relaxed than I was, especially with work and other things. If I get involved mm. in stuff, things are just like, well, really, does it matter that much? Not sure, really. sure. Yeah. Nobody died, so it doesn't really matter that much. Let's sort it out, or you know, arguments and things like that. Are, yeah, you just, uh, is, it, is it really that important? Not really. Yeah. So. Yeah, you know, coping is 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 going off, walking, yeah, you know, take the dogs out, seeing them running around and playing, and and just, I think it's the smaller things that you took for granted before that you know, which are actually a lot of times the big things, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and and definitely, yeah, you're right. The yeah, you know, just standing in the field with the sun shining on your face, yeah, you know, throwing a frisbee for the dog, relaxed, chilled, not a care in the world, almost is much better. 
Yeah, it's often when people like face like death or get very close to it that they all of a sudden and then they escape escape it, right? Um, yeah, that they look at life so much different. I feel like yeah. it's been for you a little bit like that. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Totally. I, I would get caught up on on now what I see now is stupid things. Mm. Yeah, discussions or you know things that are going on with work or other stuff, and you think it wasn't really that important at all. Yes. Yeah. yeah it, it it's not important, and it could have been sorted out, or there was other, if there were other issues that it's not important at all. The, you know, the most important thing is you know you're sat here with your family and you know, yeah, yeah, right. And other people. This is the most important thing, and mm. yeah, you know, nobody gets. You know, we know that nobody gets out alive at the end. Sure. Um, but we've been given, like yourself, been given a second chance at it. And sometimes when you read stories of the people that don't get the second chance, it actually brings it all back to you again. Like we had a guy here who was playing football in a veterans game um, and he didn't make it. And you think, well, that could have been me. And I think one of the things that I've reflected on for the anniversary is how different would have my wife and my son's life been if I mm. wasn't here? Yeah, she yeah. jokes and says she jokes and says I'd have cashed in the insurance policies and it would have been a lot better for me. But um, but yeah, I, you know what would have been their life? How, how would they have coped and survived? And yeah, my son's only sixteen, so yeah, yeah so at a really young age to to lose a father. So yeah, too young. So you you, you do reflect on that, yeah. but then you think, well, actually, it didn't happen, and we can. So I'm spending more time with him, laughing and joking, and yeah, yeah. doing that sort of stuff as well. Well, that's super powerful. Right, it moves you for sure, like even closer with the people that you care about. Absolutely, yeah, and and yeah, you know, picking up the phone to people where you say, oh, "No, well, let's just pick up the phone and say, hi, are you okay?" Yeah, yeah, talking to more people, mm. yeah, you know, the family facetimes more, yeah, you know, mm. the other people, you know, you talk more on the phone, you you tend to do more things with people than what you would have done because you'd have been busy doing work or you'd have put something off because you felt that you needed to do some more overtime or somebody was asking you to do something at work that, oh, God, I've got to do this. Sorry, I can't make this. I can't do that. Whereas now, no, we're doing that. Like we're going for a walking football tournament in June um, around North Wales. And it was like, yeah, I'll go. Definitely. Let's go. Because why not? Why would you not not go? Yeah. Yeah. Don't wait. Go, go and do it. Yes. Yeah. And I, I think that that's a, the, a, another big change for us is, Mm-hmm. Yeah, you know, when you get invited somewhere, sometimes you put it off. But now you just go, Let, let yeah, let's go and do that. Let's go talk to people. Let's go and see people mm. that we wouldn't normally see. Um, I haven't travelled internationally yet, but that's something that we're going to do at some point. So. Yeah, all right, that's exciting. Mm-hmm. Is there still something that you feel is um, just still quite difficult to communicate with the people around you, and probably like yeah, the fatigue can be already a big thing, but are there other things that you still feel are very difficult to communicate? I I think it's not having the the ICD, really. I don't think it's a a problem, but I think communicating the fact that it happened to you and Mm. that because people look at you and go, God, you look amazing. Mm -hmm. Communicating back, actually, I don't actually, you know, it's still quite raw. Yeah. And, uh, For sure. Uh, and it's helped me giving talks. I've been giving talks with the air ambulance and showing my story that, you know, that they saved me and that sort of thing. Um, and that's, so that's helped me a lot, but it, it can be quite difficult to get over the fact that, yeah, you died. Yeah. You just did. Yeah. And that, that's been a difficult I mean, my, my family obviously experienced it. When you, you see somebody you haven't seen for ages and they go, how are you? Are you all right? And you go, well, yeah, since my cardiac arrest, and they go, I didn't even know you had a cardiac arrest. Oh, my God, yeah. So you, you relive it a couple of times. Um, mm. And communicating that fact, they go, but you look so well. Yeah. Yeah, we do look well, but, yeah, it's it's been it's been hard. <laughs> it's what been do you, hard. Yeah, what do you feel is not being hurt when they say that, that they don't see, like, how difficult the journey has actually been? Yeah, I, I think they don't appreciate the, 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 the trauma that you've gone through. Yeah, yeah. It, it's, it's a lot. But they kind of just brush you to the side, like, oh, but you look good. Yeah, you so look what good, is... and, and you survived it. It's great. So yeah. you're, obviously, you're obviously okay now. So Yeah, yeah. yeah. So it's um, all over now. Yeah. And right? Well, I it's don't not. think they appreciate the psychological side that goes yeah. with it. 
that I think they look at you physically, yeah, and go, oh look, you look brilliant. But there is yeah. obviously a psychological side of, of yeah, some days things can trigger it. Yeah, if you if you're watching like we've got a British Heart Foundation advert in the UK at the moment that a young girl is collapsing playing football and she literally just goes Yeah, my wife finds it really difficult to watch that because yeah, yeah. Because that was yeah. you. Like, yeah, that was me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it, it happened. Um, and I speak to other people who, who say, like, the, the trauma, I mean, like, like yourself, where their, their, their partner or uh, somebody else has given the CPR and, uh-huh. you know, they've gone through it. I mean, that's quite traumatic for them to be working on somebody. And I, I'm quite lucky that my wife wasn't there. Hmm. Didn't have to go through that trauma. But she went through other trauma of driving, you know, an hour and not knowing whether I was alive or dead and spending 27 and a half hours not knowing whether I was going to recover or not. So they've undergone their own trauma as well. So we've talked a lot about it. And I think don't people don't appreciate, you know, they go to Mel, oh, is he okay? And then they don't go, well, how about you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That happens a lot. Yep. Mm-hmm. Yeah, they they, you know, they talk about the patient, but they don't talk about the people. And you know, my yeah. son's been brilliant. I mean, it's sixteen to cope with that. Seeing your, your father get worked on on the floor, um, yeah. Luckily, we had the team you know, took him away from it and took him away from the incident. But he still experienced it, and he was still there. Um, yeah, that's quite hard. That's quite hard for him. And me knowing that now um, has, has been quite difficult. And Amanda, who was the, the lady that came and picked him up for us because she lived around the corner. Um, she said, yeah, I was on a stretcher and um, he wanted to come over with her and just sort of, yeah, tapped me on the shoulder and said, you'll be all right, and then left. I mean, that's quite hard to, for me to know that he did that. Yeah. That's quite difficult to, to cope with. So mostly that, that's been and it, it more for, for him. Um, so me sort of coping with that, knowing that he did that, is, is quite nice, but it's also quite emotional for, for him. Yeah, yeah, of, of course, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, and this is not something that just affects us, but it affects just the whole family. Yeah. Such an event like this. Absolutely, yeah, yeah. People can to kick into action immediately. Obviously, as soon as they find out about it, they're kicking into action and they're doing stuff and the adrenaline's pumping. But it's the months afterwards when you, you find out more what happened and what they went through and other stuff as well. So there's this whole sort of trauma package. And that's where we've been, say, we've been lucky with the Wales Ambulance because they've had a patient liaison who's been brilliant and has answered all our questions and talked to us. And my ICD nurse at, way at Cardiff Hospital, Trudy, her name is, has been incredible. She asks us any question that you want about ICD. And so that support network's been really important to us. But even, you know, this is always going to be a topic in your life, right? That this has happened. Even now, I mean, well, in the end, two years is also not super long that I survived it. Uh, but I still, every once in a while, have a conversation with my girlfriend about what has happened. And it each time brings still some more healing and answers even that I didn't know. Some small details that I was like, oh, that happened too. It just, there's so much, so much that you, yeah, I'm sure in, in many, in 10 years, it's still going to be a topic with your son, you know, and with your wife that this has happened. And, uh, yeah, I mean, I, funnily enough, I went back to the, um, uh, the leisure center about six months later to meet the people who saved me. And, um, obviously they're trained in CPR, but don't necessarily need to implement it. And uh, the, the young lady who gave me the defib put the defib on. She said, obviously, as she was putting the defib together, because obviously putting the pads on and starting it up, and it's talking you through the process. She said, that all that was in my head was, please say yes, please say yes. Wow. And whenever I I messaged her on Facebook or talked to her, she sent me some photos and other things and stuff. And she says, she says it's still in my head. Please say yes. So she wow. said, I think that will be in her head forever. Yeah. Every well, time I see you or speak to you, that's going to come in my head, please say. Of course. Yeah. No matter what, you know, whether it's 10 years, 20 years, whatever, she said, I'm still going to say, please say yes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Wow, that's beautiful, actually, in a way that, yeah. Yeah, it, this is such an emotional thing, all of it, right? For anyone, for yeah. us, for the people, for even strangers that have saved us. Yeah, yeah we, people. Yeah. yeah, we laughed with the actual the legislature centre manager because we went back and because Mel hadn't been there, my wife hadn't been there, 
and I was out of it, we arrived at the leisure centre and said we need to speak to him. Mm-hmm. But we didn't know what he looked like. Mm. I had no idea what he looked yeah. like. So anyway, he came down the steps and he, he shook my hand and he said, to, uh, he said, I never forget the face of a man that I've kissed. <laughs> obviously, he gave me mouth to mouth as well. So, sure, sure. Uh, yeah. <laughs> which is quite funny. Again, he used the humour aspect of yeah, yeah. the few situation. But even that little bit was, I was like, what does he look like? I was like, mm. I have no idea what he looks like. But there was this stranger who was the manager of the Leisure Centre that was trained that kicked into action. Mm-hmm. Ellen, I um, I just have one last question for you, mm-hmm. and that's just: Do you have any like best tip that you could give to a survivor listening right now, or just any last words that you would like to share to any survivor listening? I think that the word that I have struggled with that was told to me. Mm-hmm. was be patient. And I think that is the biggest thing. You get very frustrated very quickly. Yep. It is a long process like we've spoken about. And it came again last week when one of the nurses, of, I was having my checkup, said to me, you remember you need to be patient. If your body tells you something like it's tired, it's telling you for a reason. It's not telling you just because it wants to annoy you. It's telling you you are tired. So be patient with what you're doing. And I think that's the big thing. Yeah, I wanted to get back into it. I was like, yeah, I'm fine. I'll get back into it. I'll see it. I'll do, you know, I'll be all right. I'll be all right. And then it's having that initial lot of, yeah, I'm going to be fine. I'm fine to realize that you can't do it and just being patient with it. Because it does, you know, it's got better. I can do more things now than I did six months ago. It, it's small step, small steps. Yep. Yeah, but you're doing a little bit more than what you're doing for, and I think that's it, it's that's a, it's going to be a long journey. So. That's a good way and to look at it. Forever, it's a forever journey. Yeah, yeah, you're right. And actually, for myself, hearing what you just shared is is still good to hear because <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> uh, I have trouble with that a lot too. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Patience. Patience. Patience yes. And it, it, it is difficult and yeah, it is frustrating. Uh, it can be really frustrating, yeah. really frustrating, but just be patient and really reach out. That's the key thing for us is, is we find the support groups and the people that are doing such great awareness and, and help and reach out and ask for help. If you're unsure about something, ask people. There's people that have been through this process mm. and people that have experienced what you've experienced and you know, talk to them. Don't well, how... How was it actually for you to ask for help? Because for me, in the beginning, I always, like like with the driving, for example, right? I couldn't drive for six months. So sometimes I had to ask my mom, like, hey, can you drive me? And I always I, I struggled with that, uh, to ask for help. How 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 was it for you to ask for help? Yeah, definitely struggle. You don't want to ask for help. Yeah. You know, there's people that are, are saying, oh, we'll help you do this. But you don't want to ask for help. I mean, just to go, can you drive me to the... Yeah, to the chemist, or can you drive me to the doctors? Can you, you, you don't want to be doing that. Yeah, you're an independent person. You're not, you know, twelve years old or thirteen years old, or um, and you don't see yourself as being not a disabled person, but as a person that's needing that help. You know, a couple of weeks ago, or even a couple of months ago. So it, it is difficult to, to, especially when you felt so fit and healthy, and perhaps you look okay, but you're you're frustrated because you're stuck in a situation that you do need to ask for help. And one of the things for us was with the ICD was, was was asking our a specialist ICD nurse who's been brilliant, and she's like, "Ask me anything, even if you think it's stupid. Ask me the question because I've probably had that question before, and I can give you the answer. And I can don't overthink it. Don't think, oh my god, oh my god, what about this? What about that? What about this? And if you think that you need help, tell me, ask me. That's what I'm here for. Um, and I don't think enough people do that. I don't think enough people reach out. They will they will you know Google it and find." oh my God, this is going to happen or that's going to happen as opposed to speaking to the, the specialist or somebody who's been through right. it. Yeah. yeah, I think for, I mean, people listening that, you know, don't make it even harder for yourself. Mm-hmm. It's already hard enough. Yeah. And all of us have to have, all of us almost had to ask for help uh, in the beginning. But like you said, 
you can do more now or I can do more now than I could like at the beginning of this journey. So that's actually very, that's very good to know in a way. Yeah, and, yeah back driving is, is a big thing. Mm-hmm. It gives you some independence again and yeah, yeah. doing other things and just take it step by step. And mm. don't, I think don't underestimate what's happened to you. Yep. Because you've gone undergone a lot of trauma. Yeah, I actually went on my first solo trip, which has been like this year, uh, at the beginning of this year, after two years now. I mean, I went on trips already, also abroad with my girlfriends uh, and with some friends, but it actually felt amazing. Like I was like, ah, I can do this again. Yeah, I'm <laughs> and, on my own. I'm off. Yeah. <laughs> And it didn't always felt incredibly great because I still struggle with fatigue at times too, but it felt way, it, it was possible. It was possible again. And that was amazing to feel. And that's, and even though that's a, like a small step for somebody, that's yeah, not yeah. for you. Exactly. And I think that's where people got to say, yeah, that you take a small step, but it's a massive step for you. Like driving back again. Yeah. You know, I spoke to one guy who's like, nobody will get in the car with me because I've got an ICD and they're worried that it's going to go off. And I was like, well, Tell them that it's it's not a problem. It's not an issue. I, you know, people go back in the car with me with no problems at all and, and no issues. And I was driving. As soon as that license came through, I was in the car and off. <laughs> um, and then the people are worried about it. You know, different people react in different ways. But mm-hmm. I think the small steps to keep moving mm-hmm. forward is the way to do it. But you have to be straight. <laughs> yeah. Well, Ellen, thank you just so much for taking the time and for for sharing your journey and and honestly for the many good tips and pieces of advice that you shared uh at some points you know we should maybe do a second round because there's so much yeah. more that we didn't dig into and it could also be interesting you know in maybe a year or two who knows you know yeah. to have another round to see how things have improved um That'd be brilliant. Yeah. Yeah. Fantastic. yeah but thank you again for being here on the on the podcast and uh, thanks for doing this because this is what it's all about raising awareness and, and mm. telling people's stories helps so many people so what you're doing is fantastic yeah, thank you and that concludes this episode with cardiac arrest survivor and heart warrior Ellen Owen I hope you found some insights meaning and support in this conversation between Ellen and me as always to find any resources mentioned such as the book Ellen wrote one in ten survivor life after cardiac arrest check out these show notes located in the description of this episode or you can also go directly to heartwarriorproject.com slash podcast having said that I hope to welcome you again on the next episodes of the podcast of the Heart Warrior Project. Until then, this is your host, Yelis Vaas, signing off. Before you go, i uh, just like to remind you of the Heart Warrior t-shirts and mugs I've created together with an illustrator. If you're looking for a fitting t-shirt or mug that will not only show the battle you fought and are still fighting, but also something for yourself to wear and use that will make you feel empowered. These t-shirts and mugs will be a great addition to your life. It certainly has been true for me. Additionally, you will also be supporting the Heart Warrior Project, which will help me to keep this project running. Now, if the t-shirts or mug doesn't speak to you, but you want to support the project, we also accept donations. You can find more info about all this by going to the description of this episode. There you can find a link to where you can order the t-shirts and mugs as well as other ways to support this project or you can go directly to heartwarriorproject.com to find this information.